Hello everybody and welcome to class. Today we're going to be looking at how to live a day in circadian balance. So there's a lot of squiggles and lines and wiggly stuff. We're going to go, we're going to get into this other stuff down here in a little, in a minute. But for now I want you to focus up in, up in this bit up here. So we've already learned a lot about the circadian rhythm, about causal rhythms and all of the different hormone rhythm, rhythms that we have. But now we're going to look at what this actually looks like. What, how can we practically apply all of the information that we've learned on a daily basis? So what would a day look like if we're in circadian balance? And the good thing about this is the, the circadian rhythm is a rhythm, which, is, which means that your body wants to follow this same rhythm every single day. So if you can nail this and you can get this really, you can get really into the habit of this, your circadian rhythm will enforce that and it will make it so that it almost becomes effortless to stay in this rhythm because your body will have hormones signaling to you to do things at the same time. It will, you'll have appetite at the same times in the day. You'll feel motivated to exercise because your body is in this rhythm and it likes, it likes staying in this rhythm. So it'll be hard, it'll be easier for you to stick to good habits and harder to sway out of this pattern. You'll go to bed at the same sort of time, you'll wake up at the same time, you'll, you'll be in a rhythm. So it's really nice and your body will encourage you to stay in this rhythm because really what we're doing is we're trying to help the body here. So first of all, this is this is like a time scale of going through the day. So we've got, this is like 9 a.m. around lunchtime, 3, 6, 9, 12. So this is, this is the awake portion of your day. Obviously I didn't include this sleeping portion because you shouldn't really be doing anything, you should just be sleeping. So between 12 o'clock here and the nine o'clock there, you should basically be asleep. I don't really need to draw that up for you to be able to see. But here we've got some different um, activities. So we've got like meal timings, vitamin D, when we take vitamin D supplements, light and dark exposure, and the best times to exercise and when we should be relaxing. So I'm gonna go through these. We're gonna talk about these timings and help you understand how we can, how we can optimize what these things look like in a daily basis. So this, this, this first blue line is meal timings. So we've got one pretty much as soon as you wake up. We've got one three or so hours later. This is about three and a half hours later. And then another one about three and a half hours after that. So you can see here, the whole eating window is about seven hours, which means we're using a form of a restricted eating window or intermittent fasting. And the, doing intermittent fasting this way instead of like the, 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 more, the more common way where you skip breakfast and then eat lunch, doing it this way is way better for your circadian rhythm. Firstly, when you wake up first thing in the morning is when you have the biggest digestive capacity. Your digestive enzymes have replenished, your stomach acid is strong, your bile is, has been restored, your liver spent the whole night cleaning and cleansing itself, so you're ready for food. So having a big meal first thing in the morning, really, really good. This also helps to, to soothe your, your cortisol expenditure. So as we wake up, we always have a spike of cortisol and then it goes off in a, in a, in a gradient throughout the day. And the people that are struggle, with, struggle with things like adrenal fatigue or they get to th three o'clock in the afternoon, so sort of just around here, and they've got this, this lull in energy where they feel like they need to have a nap or they have like blood sugar issues, this is where your cortisol has, you've basically run out. And the single biggest thing that we can do to, not to increase the spike, but to make sure that the, the cortisol doesn't burn, burn so quickly. So instead of it just burning like this, it's burning sort of more gradually through the day, is to have a good breakfast. Make sure that we have a good breakfast. A good general recommendation is at minimum, 30 grams of protein, 30 grams of fat. I think more than that is, is better, especially on the fat, because this, this is where we want to put the bulk of the food in, because this is where our digestive system is really ready for food. So going upwards of like 60, 70, 80, 90, even 100 grams of fat, first thing in the morning, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's going to cushion that cortisol spike, it's gonna make you feel fueled and resourced for the day, and this is the time when you're gonna have the biggest digestive capacity. So it makes sense to have the biggest meal. As we move on, you can have lunch sort of in the middle of your eating window. So this can be this can be three hours later for someone with a six hour eating window. This could be four hours later for someone with an eight hour eating window, but you don't really want the window to be any bigger than eight hours. And we're gonna talk about why when we get to this part here. 
So comes to, so you can see here, six o'clock. So six o'clock really is sort of like the cutoff point for having, for having dinner, for eating. After six, you really want to have a tendency towards like not having anything, just having water to allow your gut to clean and cleanse itself, move all of the, the food out, to have digested it all so that when you're trying to go to sleep, your liver is ready to process your awake hormones into sleep hormones to make you feel like you're ready to sleep. And that's really important. So making sure that the liver has, we're going to talk more about the liver over here. So making sure that the liver isn't still digesting your food will be really helpful. Also, bonus point, if you've got any kind of gut dysbiosis, SIBO, candida, anything like that, making sure that you're going to sleep with your digestive system empty, by far one of the biggest factors that you can do to help you recover from that. So then we've got this huge eating window, this huge fasting window. So say you've eaten between a six and hour eating, six and eight hour window, we've now got like around 18 hours of fasting, which means the body is doing all of these things that I said, restoring stomach acid, cleaning the, the small intestine. Um, the liver doesn't have to work on digesting food, so it's recycling sleep hormones and it's breaking down toxins and it's doing all of these other jobs. And this is, this is, this is massive. This is, you can get all of the benefits of intermittent fasting and none of the, da like the downsides of skipping breakfast. So none of the imbalances in the cortisol. So you get the best of both worlds with this kind of approach. Then we move into vitamin D. So this is vitamin D supplementation that I'm talking about here. And I do think vitamin D supplementation is necessary for most people because even if you live on the equator, um, geoengineering is occurring. There are nanoparticles sprayed out the back of airplanes, be it in the jet fuel as a, uh, a fuel additive, whatever, whatever the reason, there are nanoparticles that are spread out the back of planes and they deflect sunlight, particularly the UV rays. So even if you are outside and you're getting enough time in the sun to be creating vitamin D, these UV rays simply can't reach you anymore. So it is really important that we supplement with vitamin D. It's generally acknowledged as safe by even the FDA that between like seven and 10,000 IUs a day is, is safe even for, for younger people. Check those, check those numbers. I'm sure that they'll, they'll vary and change all the time. I can tell you myself, I have used dosages of up to 50,000 IUs for six months at a time. Now, I'm not encouraging you to do that, but I'm saying in cases of severe chronic illness or like really bad sleep imbalances, high doses of vitamin D can be very helpful. And this is because vitamin D isn't actually truly a vitamin, it's a hormone. If we were to think about vitamin D as a true vitamin, the vitamin element of it would be sunlight because we can actually, we can actually create vitamin D in our body when we have enough cholesterol and, we're ex and we have our skin exposed to sunlight, we're able to synthesize the cholesterol into vitamin D. So again, from the, the last classes I've been going on about cholesterol being really, really important. Yes, that emphasizes the point again, we make vitamin D out of it. But in, in our current climate with the geoengineering occurring, and even especially if you live in like Northern climates, say the UK or um, Northern Europe, you're just not even gonna be able to get enough sun exposure. So supplementing vitamin D can be very helpful. Make sure you find the right dose and try to, as I said, it's a hormone. So it's not just about it, taking it as a, making sure you hit your RDA. When we take it, it's important as well. So we wanna, we wanna receive the vitamin D in the body the same sort of time in the day when we would be exposed to sunlight. So anything past sort of 12 o'clock, 1 p.m. is kind of getting a bit late because you've got to remember the vitamin D that you take orally is going to slow release from your gut. So as a hormone, it's signaling your body that now is the time we should be awake. There's sun exposure, so we should be awake and alert. You definitely don't want to be taking your vitamin D like up here as it's getting dark because then you're signaling your body with two different kinds of messages. First of all, it's saying, oh, it's dark. It's, it's getting dark, I should get ready to sleep. But then, you're, but then you're taking vitamin D, which is the hormone that's saying the sun is out and we're synthesizing vitamin D, so we should be awake and alert. So definitely making sure that you use vitamin D on this side of the day instead of this side will make a big difference. And here we've got light exposure. So all the way through the day, you wanna be exposed to light as much as possible, especially natural light. As you can see at the minute I'm inside, this is, this is artificial light, but it's a full spectrum light. So there's all of the frequencies of light. There's the red, there's the blue. It's not a problem during the day. 
Natural light is definitely better, regardless. If you can get natural light, it's the best form of light. But once it starts reaching the point where natural light is 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 like is the sun is setting and it's becoming it's becoming dark, you want your environment to reflect that. So you don't want to be using artificial lights. You don't want to have, especially like these, these really full spectrum blue lights when the sun is trying to set. This is a really important part of the circadian rhythm because this is this is what is telling your body it's time for us to to get ready to sleep. It's time for us to start relaxing and resting and you're doing all these other things. So you've stopped eating. So your body's saying, okay, we've, we've finished eating for the day. So we're getting ready to, to rest. And then that brings us down to the, the final columns here. So we've got, these are the best opportunities to exercise. So for the observer, you already have seen that these exercise windows are a little while after you've eaten. So this is maybe half an hour, an hour after you've eaten. So digestion is already really underway. And then you exercise. This is because, and you see the exercise window stops just before you eat, because obviously you don't want to, you don't want to exercise on a full stomach, like after, immediately after having just eaten, because it's going to pull the blood supply away from your muscles where you're trying to work out and focus them in the digestive system. So you're not going to have as good performance and it's very stressful to your body. Exercise is different for everybody. Exercise can be as simple as a walk for some, for others it's high intensity exercise or like um, cardio. Everybody does a different kind of exercise. As far as adrenal fatigue and um, having like problems with sleep and things like that, there's definitely a, a hormonal element. If the adrenals are struggling, I would say you can reach a point where you can start to do more intensive exercise. Like I would say myself, I still don't think I'm fully recovered from adrenal fatigue. I'd say I've moved from stage four all the way back up to stage two, which is remarkable progress. So I have I'm not really limited by my energy in the day, but I know if I, say for example, if I was to do this exercise here without having this meal to spare the cortisol spike, this exercise is a stress on the body. So it burns through that cortisol really quickly. So you definitely don't want to be doing the exercise before you've had some food to, to slow this, that stress response from the cortisol. And you want to, you really, you really have to play this by ear. You have to listen to your body. If it gets to the point where you can, you, can, you can eat like this and you're doing your vitamin D and your light exposure and then you feel good, but then you push yourself to do some more hardcore exercise and then you notice that you're unable to sleep. This is a good sign that you've pushed yourself too hard. And the exercise, even used in the appropriate windows, is too stressful for the body and it depleted cortisol too much. So this is gonna have, a, using these above strategies will have a cortisol sparing effect, which means you'll have more cortisol to spend doing exercise. But if you push yourself too hard, too, too fast, too soon, you'll, you'll notice it in the quality of your sleep. So dial that back, don't push yourself too hard. So let's go to here, to blood sugar. So with blood sugar, it really ties into this because it's connected to the stress response. So our body becomes overwhelmed with the amount of stress that it has. And one of the biggest and most stressful things to the body is the blood sugar levels. The blood sugar wants to be kept, I've got a nice little diagram here. The blood sugar wants to be kept within these purple lines here. So this is like the safe range where the body feels happy. It's not stressing. It's like, okay, my blood sugar's here. So you can see here, we're having blood sugar spikes and dips, but for the most part, they're staying within inside this range. And this is really gonna help. Not in, not just in symptom relief. I mean, this is going to make you avoid all of the uncomfortable sensations that you get with hypo and hypoglycemia, but it's also going to help you recover in the long run because if you're doing this and you're having this massive roller coaster of blood sugar swings, so it's going really high and then really low outside of this comfortable range, every time you come out of this range, you're creating a stress response in the body. So this area up here, this area down here, up here, down here up here and down here. These are all stress responses. And when your body feels these stress, this is, a, this is a form of chemical stress to the body. So as a result, it's, your, your adrenal glands are gonna be excreting cortisol and adrenaline. And that remember that cortisol spike that we're talking about, it's gonna be burning through that really, really quickly. So avoiding coming out of, these, of this range where the body's really happy will, will help a lot. So how do we know if, this is, if these kinds of things are happening? Well, we've got hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. So to break those words down, hypo means low, hyper means high. 
Glyso is about the sugar. So you can think of glycemic index is like the glycine. That kind of word means sugar. And emia is presence in blood. So hypoglycemia means low sugar presence in blood. So to know that you're having these kinds of symptoms, you will often feel um, hangry. So that kind of sensation where it's like you feel almost angry to the point where you have to eat. You're so hungry, you have to eat something. And it's like, you're hungry, you're angry, and it's like you eat something and you'll calm down. This is pulling your blood sugar back into this comfortable range that we've got over here. And you'll really feel stressed. It'll be like, in these kind of moments, it's very easy to be triggered. It's some little stressful event can happen and you just have a meltdown. This is a good sign that your blood sugar has come out of range. Hyperglycemia is, is it usually happens because we've eaten foods that have stimulated a massive rise of blood sugar. And when this, when, this, when this rise happens, it's coming up really, really high. As it comes out of this comfortable range, the body secretes insulin. So insulin is a hormone, and this is, this is why we're talking about it in this class, because it's a hormone. So this, is all, this, this affects the whole thing. Once this hormone, because remember, all hormones are connected, so all hormones signal to other hormones. Once this hormone is raised out of this range, and insulin is secreted, stress response, like I said, cortisol is also released. But the worst part is, now that we've done this, as the insulin is released, this tells the, the cells to take in the sugar. So the blood sugar drops really rapidly, which puts you into the complete opposite state where you're now in hypoglycemia. So you feel really stressed out again, and it's like, oh, what do I do? I felt better when I ate. So then you wanna go and eat more sugar again. And then you get stuck on this roller coaster throughout the day where it's just, rocketing from hyper to hypo, hyper to hypo. And it's, it's, this, this cascade is, is one of the most important factors in, in sort of sorting this whole thing out because it's really connected into the stress response and to supporting the adrenal glands. And again, this is why we do eating like this because you've eaten first thing. At this point here, when you're eating again, you should be eating before you've reached this crazy blood sugar um, imbalance. These meals should be, I, I, I find the things that work best are moving away from refined carbs or lots of sugar, going for a more closer to keto paleo approach where we're not spiking the blood sugar up so high. Because if you eat a high blood, a high, a high uh, glycemic index food first thing in the morning, you've launched your blood sugars up and you're just going to have this roller coaster through the whole day. So if you have a, a meal at the beginning of the day that's got plenty of fat that's going to nourish the adrenal glands and make them feel safe, like they have energy and fuel to get you through the day, it's going to calm this response down and keep you on this red wave here. I mean, here you can see it's still poked out a little bit. It still came out of the reference range. And this is going to happen because when your adrenal glands are struggling, so you have adrenal fatigue or you've just been struggling for an extended period of time with these problems, even when we do the right approach, it's there's still going to be an adjustment period. And we're not all perfect. Sometimes we might go for a little bit longer than we should have before we had our next meal and your blood sugar will, will dip a little bit low and it will, it will um, elicit a stress response. But it's not about being perfect, it's just about trying to understand this is the optimal way to do it and trying to stay in this range. So going over this in summary, the five pillars. So this is the connection between the gut and the hormones and sleep and everything. So your gut, holds your microbiome and your microbiome is is now being classified as its own organ it is a significant significant plays a significant role in this so a good example is uh, melatonin is one of the so it's don't it's inversely correlated with cortisol so it really regulates your sleep wake whether you have restful sleep whether you wake up and you have energy cortisol melatonin very connected melatonin is made out of serotonin Serotonin is made out of 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, and that process happens in your gut through your gut flora. So if you don't have enough of the right gut flora and you don't have enough of the precursor, so 5-HTP, they can't turn that into serotonin. Serotonin can't come to your brain. Your, your pineal gland can't turn the serotonin into melatonin. You don't have good sleep. That's just one really clear example. But your gut is... Honestly, in, in any health problem, if you haven't taken a look at the gut first, then definitely take a look there. The Five Pillars course, if you're in the subscription, you've, you've probably already seen it. Great, you're already on the right track. If you're watching this as a standalone course, definitely take a look at the Five Pillars. It covers 
everything gut that you need to know. It goes way more into detail. The liver. The liver is also covered in the five pillars, but it plays such a big role, I couldn't help but bring it up again. So first of all, all, all of these hormones, vitamin D made out of cholesterol. How do we make cholesterol? Well, our liver makes cholesterol out of saturated fat. Good liver health means we can create more cholesterol, which means we can create more of these hormones. So good. The liver is also the place where all of these hormones are broken down. Then when they're broken down, they're packaged up, put into bile and excreted. So enormous role. If you don't have good enough liver health, your liver's struggling, it isn't going to be able to process all of these old used hormones up and get rid of them. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is like a hormone, not a vitamin. Think of it as a hormone and it will change the whole way you understand this. It's its role on your body is enormous. We've just covered the sleep aspects here. It's an immunomodulatory molecule. It signals so many different processes in the body. So make sure you're getting enough, make sure you're getting your sun exposure, and make sure you're using it at an appropriate time. Remember, physio physiologically appropriate time. The only time that we would ever synthesize vitamin D would be in the day. Don't take it right before bed, not a good idea. Meal timings and fasting. So as we covered here, at, between a six and eight hour window is generally what I find to work most effectively, and I like to front load the meals. So biggest meal at first thing in the morning, medium sized meal around lunchtime, smaller meal at dinner. This is because your digestive capacity is decreasing through the day because your body is accumulating the oxidative stress of metabolizing these foods. You haven't had a huge rest period from the, from the night before to have a, like a nice supply of bile, enzymes and acid, and we eat food to nourish us. So eating a huge meal right before you go to bed if you don't really digest it, it's not really helping you all that much. And finally, blood sugars. Anything that we can do to keep the blood sugars within this, this, within this, um, this low stress range is, is only gonna help. Not only in the short term with resolving these kind of nasty issues here, like feeling hungry and stressed and out of control and overwhelmed, but also it's gonna reduce this, this, this stress response that happens on these peaks. So there's gonna be less adrenal fatigue, it's, it's going to really help to help the adrenal glands and the rest of the body to recover from this um, chronic stressful state. So that just about covers everything for today. I hope you found this a, a helpful class and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.